speaker today, Ranjana Das, is a future day country fellow from Bhubaneswar. Did I say that correctly? Uh, yeah. Close. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> India, which is on the eastern side of India. She has emerged as a development specialist for the past 15 years or so, um, starting out with CARE, which is, I think, a U.S. agency working in India, and now with Oxfam in India. She's emerged as a development specialist working with marginalized people and poor people in East India. Her focus has been on land rights, for tribal people dwelling in contested forested lands, and also as an advocate for women who are facing abuse and violence. She is also pursuing a PhD focusing on the impact of climate change on women and their livelihoods. Das is organizing a visit this July for a, a team of people from Cornell, along with Professor Whitney Wolford, who will be our next Vice, Pres Vice Provost for International Affairs. She's been very engaged as Humphrey Fellow this past year, giving a webinar on climate change and adaptation with Professor Krasny's Civic Ecology MOOC course, presented a seminar about India and inequality at Alfred State College. She has given a seminar on agriculture and IARD course, been invited by Bennington College in Vermont to deliver a lecture on forced rights and civil society in India. She will be presenting a poster at the World Bank, is it the World Bank? Yeah, the World Bank's conference on land and poverty, along with another Humphrey Fellow, Isabel Sully, later this month. She is supporting a climate smart agriculture proposal for Bihar State in India. And she will have a professional affiliation with the World Resource Institute. For those of you who don't know about Humphrey Fellows, they're selected for their public service and leadership in their countries. It's really a big deal. You know, they, um, they have full-time jobs. There's a lot that they have to do, and yet they find the time to help people in their country to kind of lift them out of poverty or make the environment a better place to live. So for students, once well, students here are seeking to go to other countries, seek out Humphrey Fellows because they have the knowledge on the ground. They're the real practitioners. Okay, it's beyond theory. And with that, I introduce from Jonathan. Uh, thank you so much, Francine. It's, I, I didn't realize that uh, seven out of ten months of my Humphrey Fellow has passed on, and it seems uh, I, I have been really engaged in the fellowship. Thank you so much, Francine, to put it together. Uh, why I chose to do this particular topic was some of the fellow, fellows had visited India in the last semester as a part of the IARD course and uh, they came back and they were sharing with me that self-help groups is something that they have interacted with but they would like to know a bit more about this institution in India. And uh, I have been working with self-help groups, not absolutely as per uh, with self-help groups, but as a part of my work with various development organizations. And I've seen a mixed uh, kind of a development of these groups over the year. So I thought uh, that uh, let me do a little bit interaction with you that how these groups have emerged in India, how they are today as an institution, mostly in rural India, but into a part of urban India as well. And how possibly through my experience, I have seen uh, the gender question within the self-help groups because today they are quite well known as a micro level institution who are engaged in all aspects of development. But probably there is a little more uh, 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 to go walk in terms of uh, bringing the gender dimension into the self-help groups, but that's debatable. There are various research. If you Google out self-help groups in India, you will find out millions of material, millions of research. Probably in the past uh, three to four years, there's a huge debate between the evolution and the development of self-help groups and the question of microfinance. I wouldn't be delving much into that debate. My talk would be based on basically my work experience with this group as and on I have moved across development organization and how I have uh, experienced working with them. 
So I'll, I'll take you through a little bit on the history of self-help groups, that how it was conceptualized, how these groups have developed, how they have been engaged with various developmental activities, what are the challenges self-help groups have uh, faced a little bit touching upon the microfinance debate and the self-help group and then probably a bit of gender analysis of the self-help groups in India. So to put you in perspective and a little bit of background, post-independence, India got independence in 1947. Post-independence, we were grappling a bit to how to develop the rural economy. The financial sector was not doing great in terms of injecting credits to the rural economy so that rural enterprise developed. We concentrated much on green revolution to develop the agrarian sector to make the country food sovereign, but much we couldn't do much on developing rural enterprises. Uh, the primary reason being the banking sector didn't have very strong hold in the rural sector to push credit to the poor people so that they are able to develop rural enterprise. So that is the background when uh, we decided that we require probably a structured program to push credit in the rural sector so that people are able to pick up uh, enterprise or take up livelihood development and grow the rural economy. So there was this one program during the 70s which was known as Integrated Rural Development Program through which we started organizing rural people, especially women. However, uh, to note that self-help groups are in India are not only groups formed of women, we have male self-help groups as well. Those who want to collectivize, those who want to gather, we, uh, there is a system of interloaning which I'll discuss in, in a while. But this integrated rural development program was actually focusing on organizing and collectivizing rural people. Uh, putting uh, credit, uh, giving credit to them and training them so that they are able to do rural enterprise development. Now, integrated rural development program for the first time envisioned self-help group. Now, if you see self-help group is not a very new phenomena that India had started. It actually existed from the historical period. I was doing some study, it, it existed in, they are like rural informal credit economy that existed in Africa, parts of uh, Latin America, parts of Asia. So probably the concept came from there. India probably formalized that structure and took it ahead. So self-help groups became a part of this integrated rural development program and it became an institution to channelize credit and mm, a vehicle for community development. Uh, basically, government started this initiative, but government used NGOs to implement the program because government didn't have a huge tentacle at the grassroots level to organize the group. So local NGOs or the community-based organization became the uh, the. Uh, uh, the people who were actually organized the rural women uh, and bringing them together. Uh, you must, I think most of you must have heard about this organization in India, Self-Employed Women's Association or SEVA. SEVA was basically one of the very first in 50s, the trade union movement of women in the informal economy in the western part of India in Gujarat. And SEVA first showed us a way that how is it possible that it is actually possible to get women organized. Because if you see the uh, social nature of India, it is highly patriarchal. It is difficult for women to navigate the patriarchy, come together, mobilize themselves, do a savings credit. But it was first model of SEVA where they really made it happen, bring women working in the informal economy to come together, collectivize, negotiate with the landowners or the employers on their wages, their bargaining powers, etc. So the, the SEVA first showed that it is actually possible to mobilize women. So we do take, uh, give a lot of credit to SEVA to, uh, uh, on the basis of this collective model. And then there is this big organization, Myrada, in the southern part of India, who actually formalized the, uh, um, the model of self-help group in India. So these are the two pioneering NGOs, along with the Integrated Rural Development Program, which helped us to say, shape the self-help group model in India during the 70s and the 80s. Now, the bank that actually started giving credit was the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development. And today, if you Google out the annual report, you will get the entire information of self-help group that how are they doing in terms of their credit, their savings, their interloaning, their rural livelihood, how are they actually engaged into various kinds of uh, development work. Everything is uh, available in NABAD's uh, 
uh, website and annual reports. But two things I would like to draw your attention that NABARD actually helped the launching of the self-help group model in two phases. The first phase was probably late of 80s till early 1992, which was the inception phase where they uh, started engaging with the local NGOs to collectivize women. This was known as the inception phase. The whole concentration was how to bring more and more women so that they come out because uh, as I said that in India it's very difficult to bring women who are actually very active within the household uh, sector but not much in the public domain. So it took us almost a decade to bring women to come together to collectivize and start even even difficult thing is to start a uh, savings and an interloaning system. So it was given a bit of time in the inception phase to mobilize women. The second phase was 1992 onwards when it took actually the credit form like the groups were started getting linked with the banks. And once they are able to perform that they are able to do uh, interloaning, they are actually doing savings and all, they are linked to the bank, they are given loans, given credits so that they are able to initiate some forms of micro enterprise or livelihood initiative collectively or individually. Now this program later took the shape of development of women and child in rural areas which was known as DOKRA. A little later this program took the shape of Swarnijayanti Gram Swarojgar Yojana. These are all acronyms. I'm just trying to give you how it moved. And right now currently we have this huge program called National Rural Livelihood Mission and the entire self-help group model is subsumed under the National Rural Livelihood Mission. So from the late of 70s till today the number of self-help groups that have been formed those who are into enterprise, into credit system, interloaning system are entirely subsumed into this program which is National Rural Livelihood Mission. So this has been the formal journey of the self-help group model with both government and non-governmental initiatives. Now what was actually envisaged when the model started performing in India? So it was uh, envisaged that in almost every villages which is relatively poor, which shows a low income category, there will be one group uh, with a minimum of 15 to 20 members. The group should be homogeneous in terms of their economic uh, background that they, they have to come from a poor background and that's why you would need to collectivize and take loan and initiate your livelihood enterprise. They should not be only homogeneous in terms of economic angle but they should be homogeneous in terms of gender. So you today would find very minimum number of groups who have mixed gender like male and female together. Mostly the groups are either male or female. They are homogeneous in terms of caste and geography. Geography in terms of where they are economically poor in a little difficult region or in tribal belt or in uh, hilly areas. And caste, it was kept uh, a bit consciously because in India, if you see the development indicators, caste and poverty go uh, walk uh, uh, together. So mainly from poor background, from the scheduled caste community, the group started gathering. So that was the basic vision when the groups were formed. Only one person per family was the member of each of the group. The membership was based on trust because uh, uh, the f when they come together as a member of 15 to 20, the, uh, on the first occasion they are not actually linked with the bank. So uh, the first phase is that they come together, uh, 15 or 20 women come together, they start, inter, uh, they start putting money, like say 10 rupees per month. They come per month uh, for a meeting. They try and uh, discuss some of the social development, why they need to collectivize and what is the uh, need for doing this small amount of savings, what are they going to do with that savings amount of money. Those kinds of discussions were facilitated by the NGO workers who were supporting in collectivizing these groups and this savings goes for, a, um, uh, for say about six months. Once six months is over, there is a little bit of money that they collect and then they start interloaning. Like today I need, the, this month I say after, after six months, say in the seventh month, I am a member of uh, say a 15 member group. And to this month I say that I need this much amount of money to initiate something or to uh, help you know, some, some marriage or some kind of a health problem in my family. So they will give me the money. And in the subsequent month, I will start putting back the money to repay the loan in the group. 
and this interloaning pattern almost goes for two to three years when the bank, the National Rural Bank, does an assessment of the group that how have they performed in terms of their interloaning pattern, whether the loans are being repaid on correct time, whether there has been a defaulting in the loan repayment. If they find that the groups are actually performing well in terms of their interloaning pattern, then they link the groups with the bank and then the group as a collective are allowed to get a bigger amount of loan and they can do a collective initiative within their village like a lot of self-help groups have started small grocery shops have collectively uh, you know uh, repair and maintained watershed bodies have collectively helped in construction of the uh, roads in the villages have collectively put in money to repair the schools in their villages. So this sort of work started happening with the loan that they were getting in the bank, getting from the bank. But on this, at the same time, a lot of group have taken loan from the bank and have used up for their household level consumption needs as well. So there is a mixed way of how the loans have been used up once the self-help group have started getting it. And there are studies which shows that uh, uh, the most of the loan actually have gone to repay back the household level matters. Like somebody has taken a loan, have taken loan from this bank and have repaid that loan. And that was one of the reasons why self help group failed a little bit uh, later and I'll discuss all those reasons uh, in a while. Now, once the interloaning starts, these micro units become a bit more sustainable because they have to stay collectively because they have to earn back that amount of money which they have taken as a loan and have to pay back to the bank. So this becomes a micro institution. Now the good part of this institution is then the government started using this institution as a channel for any development activity. Say the government has to open a school or the government has to do an assessment of the village. Who do they catch hold of? They catch hold of this group which is there in the village because they don't move anywhere. And uh, if, if I have to say the nature of the membership, they're mostly married, so they don't move out of the village, so they are there. So if they, they became a channel of whatever program that comes to the village, self-help groups are the first point of entry. For example, they have to do a food distribution after say there is a massive drought. So who becomes the first point of contact is the self-help group because they and then later they were trained in a lot of things. They were trained in how to do a household survey. They were trained in how to do a vulnerability assessment. They were trained in to keep records of every household in their village. So when whenever anybody, any government government or any non-government organization has to do any kind of a development activity, these micro institutions today have become the bearers of data or the bearers of information about that village. So they are, they are quite a powerful micro institution at the moment. One of the base main reason was that why did we start collectivizing women? We could have collectivized men. One basic reason was men were into the formal sector or informal sector job. It was women who were within the household and the vision was that if we bring women in a, in a collective form, and India has a lot of social problem uh, related to gender. I mean, if, if you even today, if you see the data, there are issues related to child sex selective abortion. There are issues related to domestic violence. 80s and 90s in India probably have seen the highest number of alcoholism and domestic violence. This was a very grappling problem. And that became one of the entry point to collectivize the women in India. Because that was one of the, I mean, I personally have worked in very re remote region in Rajasthan, which is a desert region. Whenever I have traveled to villages, whenever I have sat with women, the only problem they started reporting was alcoholism and you know, uh, dom uh, severe massive domestic violence. And that actually helped us to organize the group because they had to fight the alcohol dealers, the liquor dealers in their shop. They had to fight uh, out the domestic violence. So that was something, a phenomenon, which helped us to collectivize women. So uh, w the major aim was that how we collectivize women, how we train them on various developmental issues, how we give them a political space, uh, we, uh, th that more and more number of women are come out as leaders and start gaining spaces within the political domain. So if you see India has uh, 
a local self governance which we know call as panchayat where we elect community leaders at the from the village level so we started uh, training these self help group members or leaders so that they are able to be a part of that local self govern uh, local self governance structures and start talking about development so they come out of the household and start uh, you know learn about the policies the laws the political structures and start playing a role there so one of the main vision of self self groups was even that not only uh, just coming out and doing savings and credit which probably is the history of self help groups like they become just a credit lending and savings institution but our vision was a little bit more that we wanted them to be a uh, to be more of a social drivers to take more lead in development work etc and today if you see the national rural bank estimates that there are almost 8.5 million recorded self help groups covering 100 million households with a savings of almost 2.4 billion usd so this is the amount of savings that's lying with the bank and you can take benefit of this savings to do any kind of a development work that, that is required in your own geography and the annual loan of take if you see it's almost 5.9 billion that's the amount of loan that they can apply or they take in and the outstanding loan is 9.5 billion usd and this is the amount which probably is running in the economy to do some kind of development work what have been the major self help groups initiative a lot i would say if you see today you will find federations of self help group that there are village level institutions which has federated at the district level which has again federated at the block level and have created Uh, a state level cooperative a state level producer company and today if you hunt some of the big ngos are actually evolved from self help group movement today if you see seva some of the sevas tentacles are an outcome of the self help group movement so they they have culminated into formal structures today they are they you will find them uh, in the form of formal cooperatives in the form of formal federation in the form of producer companies doing business with equal footing and with equal profit making uh, 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 objectives so individual you will see individual enterprises which also has grown not only collective enterprises self help groups members have taken loan they have set up a little shop in their house or in their villages and are doing business which is drawing their livelihood so those examples are are rampant we'll see various kinds of collective farming livelihood initiatives if you go to especially in southern part of india you will see that women are leasing land collectively as a cooperative and they're doing farming activities they are doing they are into food processing they are doing marketing so these kind of models are right now quite sustainable in india they're into food processing very heavily in southern part of india not only as i say that we envision self help group only as a credit or an economic body but we had envisioned them as a social body as well so we will see that self help group running food banks in some of the places which is either disaster prone or poor or vulnerable they have uh, collectively uh, farmed uh, vegetables or any kind of millets or paddy and they have fed the entire village in the time of uh, crisis they have taken initiative bihar where i write where i work right now for some of the grain banks are uh, run by the self help group which helps to feed the population when there is a flood outbreak or a disaster outbreak i will see nutrition gardens they run mid day meal scheme is something that government of india runs in the government schools that in the schools children are given one meal uh, during the day time when they come to study self help groups are some of the self help groups run some of the very successful mid day meals across india uh, you will see they in, they are involved in community work they are into some of the most important government run community level development groups like community village health and sanitation committees uh, the 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 50% of the members will be from the self help groups you will find them in water committees you will find them in local self governance they have evolved as leaders and have become political also and so on so forth they you will find them in school management committees so basically the point is they have become a conduit of any kind of a development or a livelihood promotion in india they have become a micro institution who becomes your first point of contact if you want to initiate something in any rural area of india 
some of the challenges as I said that in the inception phase we gave a lot of time for example say for 5 to 10 years so that women can come out, start collectivizing, do the interloaning, start taking loan. Now this India has a history, uh, I would say it's a patriarchal country, it, it takes a long time for the women to break those household barriers, come together, learn the tricks of the group running, learn the tricks of the trade and start taking up an enterprise or, uh, or a cooperative. Uh, the trainings in the second phase probably the whole thrust by the National Rural Development Bank was to scale up the whole model of self-help groups. In the inception phase probably we were doing much more innovative and much more intensive work in some parts of southern India and some parts of western India. In the second phase which is say 80s to mid of 90s there was a huge urge that let's uh, spread and let's replicate and let's scale up this model because this model is showing result in terms of pushing credits. The other uh, possibly the economic reason was rural banks, uh, the, uh, public sector banks wanted to develop their rural branches and then they saw a big business into the self-help group model. The more number of branches they can open, the more number of self-help groups start putting their money there and the rural banks open. So in uh, while in order to do that, in order to increase the financial inclusion, what went probably wrong was that number of groups increased because NGOs were given money so they increased the number of groups but what possibly didn't happen very intensively was training so the capacity buildings to hold their hands so that they are able to come they are able to because livelihood intervention in India requires a lot of training one has to be connected with the market to operate a successful livelihood or enterprise building so possibly that took a bit more backseat so quality of the groups probably declined but the quantity increased uh, now, as I said now microfinance became a bigger agenda within the self-help groups the way we envisaged in India to make self-help groups as a social movement microfinance started taking over so this small small microfinance bank started growing by picking up women from within the self-help group and started pushing loan to them as an individual so probably the group started breaking at that point of time so then then this whole movement had been shaken a bit but i would say still today these groups are active in terms of their community institution and groups from the socially marginal communities couldn't benefit much probably one reason i could attribute is the remoteness of their location uh, not much training reached out to them they were not connected to the banking system and trainings didn't reach to them properly and there are social uh, dimensions or social barriers attached to it india has a caste system much of our tribal groups are very remotely located and all these reasons probably didn't uh, work well for the groups from the socially marginal communities. Now having said that I was trying to see that how did gender apply, gender got a role to play within the self-help groups. Now apparently it might look that since it's a cadre of women who forms the self-help group probably gender has been taken care of probably the women who have been a part of self-help groups have all been empowered now this is a very tricky question and uh, tricky why I say on the prima facie you might see all the images that I have shown are all women coming out doing enterprise building and doing successful livelihood well they, they might some have failed because of training because of various other macro issues but uh, one might argue that okay Come on, 8.5 million SAG, uh, self help groups, all women, if you say, say 90% women, and you don't say it's women economic empowerment. So, what I try to do is this is one of the framework that we use in the development sector to understand that if there is a development phenomena, whether it is trying to take care of the gender relation within the household, within the community, within the formal structures, within the institution. So um, I think in the IARD last semester this was discussed in one of the sessions. What we try to see is that whether any kind of a development phenomena is actually rendering to develop men's and women's consciousness building, whether they are getting empowered as a self, whether it is working, this, this is the informal sector, household or the community 
and it can it can move either from top to bottom or from bottom to down whether these kind of development phenomena are actually trying to bring social changes in the social norms or whether it is hitting the patriarchy whether it's in a true sense empowering women so that they are able to alter the gender relations within the household and the community whether this kind of phenomena is actually giving access to women on their property on the land or any kind of resources that they are meant to get through that phenomena or whether the women are collectivized or empowered enough to bring changes in laws and policies of the country in their favor so this is a kind of framework that allows us to see that whether any kind of development phenomena has the ability to alter gender relation or the or has the ability to empower women in the true sense this is one framework that i try to apply this is another iceberg that we use that to see whether the development phenomena has the ability to change the feelings the perception the norms the values the thought which actually underpins the patriarchal nature of the society some of it which you can see possibly uh, you know 8.5 million self help group now coming together building enterprise going to the political institution being leaders some of it are seen which we can see but some of it are invisible like social norms that a women has to very little norms that a women has to take permission before she comes and joins the meeting now we don't know that because we only see women coming and sitting in the meeting whether she has to negotiate a bit more of a social barrier within the household we don't know so this is something that we wanted to see whether the self help group model have been able to hit this uh, hidden norms and structures which operates within the society okay there was a figure here it didn't come right uh, i wanted to show sorry i don't know it didn't come what i wanted to show here was there is, uh, i mean this slide might look a bit off the record but this had a list of i'm sorry <laughs> this had a list of social norms which actually contributes to the incremental violence against women in india and some of the social norms which we can't see but national health uh, family health uh, national family and health survey they have recorded the social norms while doing the survey and where women have told that these are the norms which are actually uh, are actually causing domestic violence in india some of them are mobility of the women is restricted like you have to take permission if you have to go out and part participate in any kind of a community development work if you don't take permission you probably face domestic violence if you don't take care of your children you face domestic abuse if you don't take care of your uh, in laws within the household you face domestic violence if you don't agree to something happened if you don't take um, uh, if you refuse to have sex with the husband you face domestic violence so these are some of the norms that exist without any record for due to which probably women face domestic violence the reason why am i telling you that is the iceberg that i showed the norms that persist which is unwritten or unrecorded are those kind of norms which uh leads which actually gives rise in the domestic violence cases if women don't follow that so whether self help groups had the ability to change or to empower women to an extent that they are able to change these norms in their favor so that was the reason i had this slide i don't know why it came but if you want you can access the slide in this uh in this link now i don't have the legitimacy to talk on the entire 8.5 million of self help groups which is existing in india right now but my experience uh, is based on three models that i have worked very closely with one is a self help groups and a vegetable chain production model that we are currently running in the state of bihar it all, it approximately has 3500 members across 30 35 villages in two districts of bihar 
One is a model of a fishing women cooperative in the eastern part of India, in Orissa. It has 4,000 self-help group members right now. It's a full-fledged cooperative and a business. It's called Samudram and it's a producer company right now. And one is in the uh, self-help group of almost 200 self-help groups associated with it. They do business with Golden Grass product. They are also a company right now. Uh, they, they are into a livelihood uh, promotion enterprise. So what I figured out was, I mean, these are all based on my experience. So these are some of the photographs of these three groups. The, the model that I showed here, I had tried to give a little bit of analysis across these four quadrants. And here are we. That probably in terms of women's and men's consciousness, definitely women have gained confidence. Because if you see 8.5 million women currently coming out, their confidence level have gone up. Their confidence level even have gone up when they have been able to do successful interloaning, when they have been able to take loan from the bank and start their livelihood. This definitely has contributed to their immense uh, confidence they, that they the, the sheer fact that they are able to create an institution was something very wonderful uh, they definitely found their, their role in the Indian economy because they were uh, coming and sitting into the uh, development meetings in the villages they are a part of village health and sanitation uh, committees they are a part of school management company uh, uh, committees so these have given them a kind of they, they figured themselves out that they can play a role in the school development. They can play a role in the health sector. They can play in the whole role in the in deciding that where should the water body be in the village. They can they do play a role in the collective farming. So this is a newfound role for women in India post independence. Men definitely have become much more supportive. Sheer because of the fact, if not because of the fact that gender relations have been altered, but because of the fact that they are now seeing women as an economic agents of the country. Women's access to resources and opportunities, definitely there has been a lot of trainings done to them. Collectively, women have leased land and have started doing farming there. So their access to land leasing have gone up. The technologies is something that self-help groups are really using now for marketing. So there, uh, there are models like the Fisher Folks model that we that I showed you. They use uh, SMS technology that from the market they get SMS in the their own phones that today the uh, the price of one particular fish in the bigger market is this and then they take a collective decision whether they will sell their fish products today or on a day when they get a better price. So they definitely use this technology and to tell you that uh, in India right now uh, about 60 to 70 percent of women are literate. The literacy level of uh, Indian women is lesser than the literacy level of Indian men. Despite of the fact we were able to train women on various things. So the SMS technology is something where we first had to train women on their literacy so that they are able to read and write and that definitely has given them a mileage to adopt technology. Where we have failed to do literacy rate because mostly women are adult, training them on literacy was becoming little difficult. We have used various forms of ICTs to give the impart the training modules, to give them proper information. So a range of ICTs today is available in India to train the self-help groups, where probably there is no letter mentioned, but all the pictorial diagrams or all sorts of uh, uh, you know, uh, flip books, uh, posters, charts have been used to train them. So we have used various kinds of methods so that more and more women are able to take uh, benefit of uh, resources. And they have, they are, there are attempts to connect them with the market. The three models that I have shown, it has taken us time, but today they have successfully, you know, gained the space in the market uh, space to sell their products, to do trading, and to tell you that they lead on the trading. In some of the model between 2000 to 2010, we have seen that even within self-help groups, gender was operating. Like women were doing the job, like developing the products. It was men who they had to hire to do the accounting and marketing, because accounting and marketing is something probably which men does more in India because of the fact that there are more number of literate people in India. But today, if you see more number of men are leading on that front also. They are doing their own accounting of their own business. They are also doing the marketing of their own products. 
and there are various platforms to share their experience. You will find out today that there are various uh, local markets, heart, uh, we, something we call hearts, which is a market of handicrafts and stuff where, where self-help group members come and showcase their product and do their trading. Formal laws and policies, possibly the laws that India passed doesn't come from their desk, but they have majorly contributed uh, in terms of passing laws against domestic violence. Uh, huge at, uh, during 2004 to 2005 when we were fighting to get a domestic violence law in India, self-help groups from across the India rose up. They demanded for a law because they were suffering within the household from domestic violence. So they have played an immense momentum. They have given an immense momentum in formalizing some of the laws and India government had felt the pressure from these groups. They are currently a big part of our local self-governance, so they are definitely raising voices in terms of, uh, you know, what are the development priorities in, in some of the villages, what could be done, and so on and so forth. Probably this is one quadrant where we have seen mixed result. Like, uh, I at least cannot say very blanketly that whether social norms have changed, because even today if you see the facade of the groups are women, but a lot of them are still negotiating within the household. So if they have to come to a group, they still probably have to take permission from the husband. If they have to take up a livelihood initiative, it's probably not a loan decision. It has to be negotiated within the household. But having said, I mean, in some of the cases, we have seen that women coming and participating in the uh, self-help group activity have gone back home and have faced domestic violence for the fact that she was coming out. Probably her mobility was increasing. In some cases, we have seen that the, the amount of money that they have got when they have started doing livelihood inter enterprise building, uh, probably there was a reinforce of gender stereotypes. So in southern part of India, if you go to Andhra Pradesh, you will now see probably every second household has a beauty parlor because that's the first kind of inter enterprise women uh, started because that, that's, that's what was giving them quicker money because there is a huge demand of beauty parlors there. But whether this is a feminist way of using enterprise building, that's still not debatable and there were huge discussion around that. And in another state, in Kerala, there is a model called Kudambashri, which gave a very interesting phenomena that girls were joining the self-help groups, like adolescent girls, right before their marriage. Why? Because they had to earn from the self-help group interloaning activity and pay for dowry. Now, dowry is something which is very prevalent in India, that when an Indian girl gets married, her father has to give a big amount of money to the groom's family. So these girls were joining the self-help group to earn from the group activity to earn for their own dowry. Now how uh, empowering that is, is still very debatable because it's actually reinforcing a social norm. Now, but at the same time, women did spend, when they started earning out of it, they started spending more on the softer uh, aspects of the household. So women started spending on children education, women started spending on health of the family, because it has been seen that when men gets money, either it goes, of course, it, part of it goes on household, but part of it also goes on alcoholism or any other practices. But it's women, when they started getting money, they started spending more on these softer aspects. So girls started going more to school because the mother wanted the child to go to school and earn education. So we have seen kind of mixed. At the same time, we have seen women in the villages or women at the blocks have collectivized and fight domestic violence. They have actually, there are, there are case studies, if you Google out, you will find that liquor barons in some of the districts have been outthrown completely by collective pressure of the self-help groups. In western part of India, Rajasthan, where water is a very big problem, it is because of the pressure of these groups, uh, the district collector has been forced to start uh, watershed development in some of the villages. So there has been a big collective momentum that gr these groups have brought. But probably within the household sector or within the community, those unseen social norms or those unseen practices which are not written anywhere but which women experience in her day in day to day life, 
that needs to, we need a longer way to go that and we have tried various models that when once the self help groups have developed themselves as an economic agent we have tried doing trainings with them on social issues like dowry violence against women sex selective abortion child marriage now these are some of the things that they are getting trained they are trying to understand what is causing it and if they can collectively fight against this so this was it now I, i would be happy to do a further more interaction yeah thank you yeah if you have some question was the best i mean, that's a really great overview and analysis of self help groups it's uh, really gotten me more enlightened I'm wondering your time here as a Humphrey fellow what are you getting out of Cornell that can bring this back it seems like you you should you're teaching us what what are you taking back as a Humphrey fellow what are you studying as a humphrey fellow i have been now undergoing a lot of leadership trainings now if you see the model of the self help groups right now there was a urgency to develop them as economic agents right so that they are able to do livelihood stuff and all and now slowly we are trying to inbuilt social components into these groups so that now leadership is something where we haven't done much with this with this group that how you develop yourself as a leader try to negotiate probably in that fourth quadrant so maybe the groups with whom i am engaged right now because i i can't take that responsibility of entire india but within the purview of my organization some of the modules that i have gotten here what i'll try to do is to customize it if that can be tried with the groups there because some of the modules are geared to professionals like us but it has to be translated to absolute grassroots women to uh, which is not impossible because the components of the modules can definitely be translated and maybe there is a need to do more leadership development so that while they act as economic agent they evolved as leader also to work on the fourth quadrant because that's much more uh, complicated and much more social Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, in part of that question, have you learned from the experience of other countries like uh, microcredit and other things? Yes. so one of the i mean not much on the group because as i said that india's group had a visioning of doing social movement as well but definitely some of the micro enterprises the fisher folks cooperative that i showed you was actually a model adopted from bangladesh so and which was supported by the gramin bank at one point of time yes from bangladesh we did yes please how many were talking in the beginning i was talking about that i mean Yes, this is something which probably you asked and I would be happy to engage more. Actually a bigger critique was this was bringing in dual responsibility to, to women. And if you see some of the cases that if women have to come to attend a meeting, she cannot put her household work back she has to finish her household work she has to feed the children she has to feed the family member and then in her resting time so majority of the women were not resting if they have to come for the meeting because it was at the cost of their afternoon resting time they have to come so at a point of time yes it was a dual pressure on them and we were thinking that if they are becoming a conduit of development then where are we considering their unpaid care work that they are doing at the household level so that's something we are still grappling with but at the same time there is this urgency of making them as livelihood agents yeah but yes true yeah chris Um, so you had mentioned that there were some issues when they scaled the self-help groups, and a lot of the products that self-help groups make, for example, bags and and foods, are sometimes substitutes with what other self-help groups make. So, is there a number that uh, is kind of the equilibrium point where after that number, then you see self-help groups competing with each other and not able to pay back their loans, 
And where does the 8.5 million number sit in reference to that equilibrium point? So now I would say the 8.5 that you say probably 50% of them are really successfully doing uh, what they are supposed to be doing, like how we have envision, envisioned them. But the rest 50% are grappling. I mean, I can't give you the cut exact numbers. Nabad's report will give you a fascinating data around it. They are definitely grappling because the whole urge was like, you scale up on numbers, but you really don't do quality inputs on them. So while some got market linkage, and some of them, the rest 50% who are not doing great are actually grappling on the market linkage. The problem is not with the product that they develop, because if you see most of the self-help group do household based product, and then they make things which are with locally available stuff. So that is not a problem. The problem is how to link them with market. And there is another problem, which is cultural. Because the products that self-help group make, probably the market that India right now has, has a huge boom of Chinese product plying the market. You must be knowing it, right? In terms of competing those Chinese stuff with a little basket that a woman prepares within the household, which takes us a four hours no you see what competition she is fighting so i wouldn't say that she is actually fighting the banking system she is also fighting the whole globalization which is doing to indian economy right now so that's a bigger challenge now bank can give you a loan and to some extent give you the training ngos can help you to shape up now where do i fight the bigger market which is swayed by stuff which probably you know globalization has done so it's a bigger fight i would say yeah uh, thanks, Rajan. Uh, I, I, mean, I would imagine dealing with social norms can get very complicated. I'm just wondering if uh, uh, you know if any of these groups have ways of engaging men in the community in trying to communicate this movement so that, uh, you know, is it, do you know of any, any way in which these groups engage men as well yes. in terms of communicating this? Otherwise, I would imagine it would be just coming from one side and then the other side doesn't necessarily understand what's going on. So one, one clear way of institutional engagement was that these self-help groups, when they were getting loans, in order to develop themselves, they were communicating with the local self-governance, which we in India call panchayat. Now panchayat, if you see the gender balance of panchayat, it's heavily male dominated. Now the groups have to negotiate with these men to help them on market. Now while doing that, there are a lot of other social um, uh, engagement that the women have done with the panchayat, which is, which is a patriarchal institution. And there are models where panchayat have learned from the groups that why alcohol is bad for the community, why there is a need to develop health systems in the community, why there is a need to develop a school rather to develop something else or, or say a big uh, store because children need to go to school. Now these are the softer developmental issues that these groups have been able to, you know, influence to some of the panchayat in order to do a development which is probably much more needed and required. Yes, there are evidences of that as well. And, and panchayat, I, I would say it is a kind of a men engagement because panchayat is very patriarchal in India. And then there are mixed groups also where they negotiate with the group members, but those are not good in numbers. Yeah. Thank you, Francine. Thank you for your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Francine.